if you're taking notes today, this talk is called, What is God Like? I'd like to frame my talk, and then I'd like to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us today, and then we're going to get into it. The, the uh, first thing I want to do is I want to take a look at some hard passages of Scripture. I think we have a propensity to ignore hard passages of Scripture, particularly my generation. My generation shies away from anything in the Bible that is remotely weird or challenging at times, right? And so what I want to do is I want to like look at the darkness of the Bible for a moment today. Um, Number one. Number two, I, I think that sometimes we're afraid of tensions. We don't know what to do with tension in Scripture where God, you know, could be both holy and love, which is kind of what we're going to talk about today. What is God like? Um, and we have a lot of spiritually immature people, particularly in my generation, because we throw out tension and we sort of tear out passages of scripture from our Bibles that disagree with our very narrow theology. And, and spiritually mature people are people that are able to understand the tensions in scripture uh, and not reject things in scripture that might challenge them or seem difficult. Um, you know, difficult to understand. I mean, Peter literally said that Paul's writings were difficult to understand. You know, but he didn't discredit them. He just said they're challenging to understand. And so you're going to, you know, being a Christian isn't going to be easy. You're going to have to learn a little. It's going to be challenging, right? Uh, one of my, my professors in school, uh, in, in Bible college, used to t say all the time, truth is intention. All truth is intention. And he used the illustration of like a pup tent. And you have ropes pulling on this side, and then you have ropes pulling on this side, but those, that tension keeps the tent up, okay? And so a holistic biblical theology is a theology like that, you, that, you know, when bad things happen in your life, you're not shocked because you have a theology of suffering. You know what I mean? Like, instead of this, you know, oh, you know, life is just a fairy tale. Yeah, well, Jesus said that, you, you know, uh, in this world, you will have trouble, that's a promise that you can claim. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? And so if you have a holistic theology that way, then you're not going to be shocked when that promise from Jesus shows up. <laughs> you know, in the form of a job loss or an illness or a death. You know, you hear me? So God wants us to be prepared and to, to understand and not to walk through life just kind of like not knowing him accurately and not understanding life. Um, and it's, it's, there's some sort of paradoxical nature in tension as well where, you know, as a child, I knew that my dad was loving and also I was afraid of him. I was able to, to reconcile that tension. You know what I'm saying? If I, you know, I knew my dad loved me and I better not put my feet on the couch in front of him. You know what I'm saying? But all of a sudden you're 21 and you can't reconcile the difference in God. You know what I mean? That God is loving, but don't put your feet on the couch in front of him. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> no, my generation has this idea that God is a desperate boyfriend. Wow. Right? That God is Enrique Iglesias. <laughs> you can run, you can hide, you, but you cannot escape my love. You know what I mean? God's like this stalker. You know? No, God is not a desperate boyfriend, and you're not cute. <laughs> You're a sinner. <laughs> You're kind of gross. And he loves you in spite of that. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're far worse than you think you are, and you're more loved than you'll ever know. And that's a tension. Right? That's a wonderful tension of Christianity that should cause some spiritual maturity. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, help me. And Holy Spirit, I'm thankful that you're here. And Holy Spirit, I ask you that you would speak through the scriptures that we read. You inspired the scriptures. All scripture is God-breathed. And Holy Spirit, I ask you that as we read these passages of scripture, you would do the work that only you can do because we're just reading your words. We're thankful for that. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Can we just pray one more time? I, I want to pray for the church in Afghanistan. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. It's just on my heart, really quickly. Father, we lift up Christians in Afghanistan to you right now. I'm asking you, God, that you would intervene. God, that you would protect them. Lord, that you would lead them and guide them and give them strategy. And Lord, that you would even protect them from people that want to hurt them, God, and do them harm. Father, would you send your angels and give them charge over them. In Jesus' name, we lift them up to you. Amen. Okay, I'm glad we did that. Okay, John 4. John 4, 24. John 4, 24. This is Jesus talking. And he says this, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. What Jesus means by God is spirit is not that God is a disembodied ghost. That's not, you know, that God is somehow... Uh, a bodiless wraith, and he's he's just, you know, he <laughs> God is uh, a vibe. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, just vibes. I'm sending vibes to you. Yeah, vibes don't help anybody. <laughs> God is a person. He has a mind. He has a will. He has a character. You hearing me? You know, um, God is not a, a, a cosmic force. Um, but God exists outside of what we know. God is spirit, and that's what Jesus means by God is spirit. As human beings, we're having this experience in time, space, and matter. Time, space, and matter. Um, in quantum physics, time, space, and matter, they all exist together. They can't exist without each other. So, for example, like Stephen Hawking, uh, who was a brilliant uh, astrophysicist, etc. he was trying to locate the point where time, space, and matter like began to exist because the universe is expanding. And so they're saying, if the universe is expanding, then obviously it had a point of origin. Um, and so that point of origin is what they call the, the Big Bang. It's what scientists call the Big Bang, right? And so the idea is simply whatever created time, space, and matter must exist outside of time, space, and matter. You hearing me? So as Christians, it's not a whatever, it's a whoever, right? So we know, obviously, we call God the big banger. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? He's the one that got this party started. God exists outside of time, space, and matter, right? And so when Jesus says God is spirit... Um, this is what he's trying to get after. He's trying to, look, God is outside of this experience, dude. In fact, God is embodied, right? Like we see in the book of Revelation, we see God has a physical, but whatever his physic physicality is, uh, it is something much weightier than whatever you and I are experiencing right now. Okay? Um, God is spirit. And he's, he's, to use Wayne Grudem's words, a theologian, he is qualitatively other. He's qualitative. He's just something else, man. Now, God has put some of his qualitative other inside of you. It's called your human spirit. Right? You've got eternity in your heart. The spirit is eternal. God has created that. And that is the part that God speaks to. And that's the part that recognizes his working. Deep calls unto deep. You hearing me? Right? Like spirit to spirit. And so that's what we mean by spiritual experiences, that somehow the eternal in us is connecting to the eternal in him, right? The impossible in him is connecting to the impossible in us, okay? Um, and Jesus is going, that's great, that's awesome, but Father is looking for somebody who will worship him in spirit, yeah, and in truth. And what Jesus means by that is God wants to be known accurately, and he wants to be worshipped accurately. He's given you a mind. He wants you to worship him with his mind. And to know him accurately. To not think that you are in charge of everything. And everything is on your terms. But God is, right? God obviously communicates to our minds and to our beings. And he goes, this is who I am. And, and he communicates concepts like his holiness and his love and his justice and his mercy. So that we can know what he is like so that we can worship him accurately. Now, I will never be able to know God exhaustively. Never. 
right? Like, <laughs> like there's just things about God that we're never going to know, ever. Like, when we get to heaven, we're not going to look up at him. Oh, I get it. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> totally, it makes sense now. Yeah, totally. Like, you were never born. You just have always been. Yeah, I get that. You know what I mean? No, that's going to blow your mind for eternity, and it will be cause for, for his glory and his praise eternally, right? And he's just like, whoa, who is this guy? Right? I can't know him exhaustively, but I can know him accurately. I can know him accurately because of his words, his scriptures. So God is, see, the, the Bible is God's self-definition. It's his self-revelation. It's God going, look, I want, to, I want you to worship me, and I want you to know me, but I need you to know me accurately the way that I am, not in your projection of me, not in your manipulative illusion of me, where you're recreating yourself, essentially. I'm not you. I'm me. <laughs> right? That's why there's verses in the Bible like, uh, his ways are a little higher. <laughs> his thoughts are not your thoughts. You know, it's, it's, it's obviously, it's ob it should be obvious, but it needs to be said by the prophets to create some self-conscious. Okay, so hi, I'm God. Right, yeah. So my thoughts aren't your thoughts. No, they're not. I think other ones. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I am a person and I have thought I have preferences and I have thoughts that are not yours. Let's keep moving. Revelation four eight. And and here I want to paint a, a picture of what God is like. Revelation four eight. Um and the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. Okay, they're weird looking guys. And day and night, they never cease to say it. So they fly around God's throne with their wings and their eyes are just Googling God, like a tree full of owls. And, and day and night, and right now, right now in heaven, they are doing this. They're circling his throne and they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So when they're picking a word, a descriptor, to call God and to, and to describe him accurately, they choose the word holy, right? Not love, love, love. That's the Fab Four, the Beatles. It's a different song. This is the, another Fab Four, the, the four living creatures, right? Now, in the Bible, over 400 times, from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, God is called holy, okay? In one passage in the New Testament, he's called love twice. In my generation, you'd think it would be the opposite because that's what the theology feels like is that God is this desperate boyfriend who's just pillows and, and flowers and chocolates and just obsessed with you because you're cute. And it's, I call it uh, Christian Buddhism. It's, it's spirituality. It's I'm on a journey and I'm just, and it's spirituality on my terms. Right? And you got, kind of get to create whatever that means to you. You know, like, and I could never serve a God who is like this. Right? Well, God, God's not like you. doesn't think like you. So you can either have a relationship with him that's accurate, which is what the Father's looking for, or don't. But Christian Buddhism is not Christianity. You hear me? Okay. God is holy. His holiness has to do with his absolute moral perfection. He is perfectly good, and he will never compromise. He is so committed to his holiness that he will not compromise it. And that's good for you and I. In fact, God's love flows from his holiness. His, his love is a holy love. Because he is morally perfect, he loves us. But he cannot be near sin. And so the story of the Old Testament and the New Testament is a God who is perfectly holy that keeps on getting close to us, initiating relationship with us. Adam, Eve, where are you at? We're naked. Oh, <laughs> how did that happen? Uh, we sinned, you idiots. All right, I'm going to cover you. I'm going to cover you. We're going to still have a relationship. Let me cover you. You hear me? And he just keeps on getting close. Israel, I'm calling you out of Egypt. I want to be your God, and I'm going to bless you, and I want to be close to you. I want to travel with you. I want to 
open rivers for you and, and provide for you and be, but hey, I want to get close to you, but oh, not that close. I'm holy. <laughs> you hear me? And then ultimately, the cross. Next, next verse though, we already said this, 1 John 4, 8. You know, anyone who does not love God does not know God because God is love. In 1 John 4, we see that God is love twice there. And it's true, God is love. And God so loved the big bad world that he sent his only son. Right? We know that God is love. I love psychometrics. Obsessed with them. Um, I love the Enneagram. Okay, my brother believes that the Enneagram is demonic. But I'm, I like it. My wife is obsessed with the Enneagram. She's always just like, oh, you're doing that because you're a three-wing four. You know, like, um, you ever, you know, know people who, like, call people, what's your number? You know, it's like... <laughs> Um, I like that stuff. I like Myers-Briggs personality assessments. Anybody ever done that? You know, I'm an ENTJ. Uh, I like strength finders. That stuff is cool. Um, I like, the, you know, those quizzes on Facebook, like which Disney princess are you? <laughs> you know, which Star Wars character are you? You know, I love that stuff. But, it, and, and I, and, and, you know, there's, a, there's an element of truth to it, right? Like, there are five stages of childhood wounding, and your ego is just the way that your personality is trying to protect you as you go about in re- human relationships, and we all have propensities and proclivities, you know, towards certain be- types of behavior because of our various wounding, and so we're just trying to navigate this world, and it's scary, and, and so we protect ourselves this way, etc. I get that, okay? And your pers- personality is the manifestation of all that. That's fantastic. Uh, but it's not the truth about you. It's not really the truth. The truth about you is that you are your passions. The Latin word passion means to suffer. You are what you're willing to suffer for. That's who you are. You know, what are you willing to suffer for? That's, that's what you love. That's who you are. You know, Buffalo Bills fan. Willing to suffer. <laughs> I'm a Toronto Maple Leafs fan, right? We haven't won in like 70, 80 years or whatever. You know, like, it's who I am, you know? When I, look, when I look at the cross, that is what God is like. It's, it's because I can see his suffering there. It is God suffering. And what is he suffering for? He's suffering for his holiness and he's suffering for his love. God, what are you like? I'm like this. I'm holy and I'm loving. And I will not compromise on my holiness. And so I will receive my own wrath and deal with my wrath and deal with sin because I want to be close to you, but I can't be close to somebody who's unholy. So I'm going to make you holy by suffering. Isn't that cool? And I'm doing this because I love you so much and I want to be close to you. Isn't that so cool? God is love. God is holy. God has a holy love. And that's what God is like. Now, the danger of not knowing what God is like is not that you just don't have a deep spirituality. That's not what we're risking, okay? My thesis today is that there's actually a lot more at stake. I think that it is profoundly unhealthy to worship God in a way that a Christian Buddhist would worship God. It's better to just not worship God. It's safer to do that than to be lukewarm. It's way safer. And that's what I'd I'd like to show you today. My uh, my niece, her name is Georgie. She's three. Uh, She has an older sister named Frankie. Frankie. We call her Frankie because her name's Francesca. We call her Frankie because she's naughty. Um, She... um, Francesca's like for a nice person, you know. <laughs> Frankie's like, she's mental. She looks like she was born in the panhandle. She looks like, like the daughter of Joe Dirt. Have you ever seen the movie? She's got like a long mullet at the back and like her hair won't grow in the front yet. It's, like, it's hilarious. And she's kind of aggressive. She's a bit of a bully. She's always wearing spandex so she can get into a fight, you know. Like um, she's just, she's a tomboy. She's awesome. Her and I watch Jurassic Park, like all the Jurassic Parks together. And like when people are getting eaten, she's like, yeah! You know, I'm like, okay. Um, <laughs> so, so Georgie's three, and Georgie is a total girl. 
Um, she plays with Barbies, and when they when her Barbies are talking, I love to listen in when she's playing with her Barbies. And hello, honey, how are you? Oh, hello, my darling. Darling and honey are her two words that they call each other. It's like so girly. And um, she loves to get her nails done, and she loves to wear jewelry, and she is obsessed with dresses. She will only wear dresses. And she's in this thing right now, total queen. And she's in this thing right now where uh, uh, she has to wear a dress that swirls. And, the, and when she puts a dress on in the morning, uh, she'll go like this, you know, stand in front of her mirror, and she'll put her foot like that, and she'll go. <laughs> and she looks down and makes sure that the dress swirls. I was FaceTiming my mom and my sister and Georgie a couple of weeks ago. And they were up in Canada, and my mom had thrifted a bunch of dresses for Georgie. And my mom's a uh, uh, seamstress. And so mom, you know, a bunch of them um, had pins in them. And so Georgie's, you know, swirling them. And my mom knows where to make them, you know, to cut them, whatever. And one, you know, had the pins in it, but the pins were too low. And so Georgie puts the dress on, and, you know, she's like this. And I'm face on, and we're watching. And she, she tries to make it swirl, and it wouldn't swirl. And she started to bawl her eyes out bawling her eyes out. and so we had to get the, get the dress off of her and put another dress on her that swirls and <laughs> you know <laughs> that's a Christian Buddhist like when, when, when the Bible doesn't swirl for them like, get, get it off me get it out of you know, way. <laughs> it's, it's, all, it's all about Georgie it's all about her little journey of dresses. Georgie doesn't know me accurately. You know, like, I, 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 I'm the uncle who hooks her up with Krispy Kreme donuts, Barbies, and chocolate. I might as well be Willy Wonka. <laughs> she doesn't care to know me accurately. It's all, it's her world. You hear me? She's a Christian Buddhist. <laughs> you know, and all of her her mis her, her her behavior, her her bad behavior, you know, is it's kind of celebrated at this point. You know what I mean? Like, oh, look at she's being rude. Oh. <laughs> you mean, oh, I'm cute. You know, no, no matter what I do, this that's just not reality. She just doesn't realize that we tolerate it because she's three. You know what I'm saying? And there's stages of our spiritual development that God's just like that's. You know, okay, it's annoying, but I'll let it slide. <laughs> you hearing me? But that's, that's not going to be how, how it is. Because I want you to, to grow into maturity. Into, into manhood, into womanhood. The Father is looking for people that will worship Him in spirit and in truth. So... Let's look at my thesis. We're going, to, we're going to look at the darkness here. We're going to look at some passages of scripture that might be troubling for you, but just sit, relax, and I promise it's going to end on a good note. Okay? Here we go. Uh, Genesis 4. We're going to start at the first worship service in the Bible. Okay? Which ends in disaster. In the course of time, Cain, brought the, 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 Cain is the first Christian Buddhist. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering, an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn, okay, of his flock, the first thing that came from his flock, the, the, the best, and of their fat portions, which is ancient Near Eastern speak for the good stuff, okay? Not just like, there's this repetitive theme in the New Testament where God's like, don't bring lame animals to me. Uh, make sure that there's salt in your in your your offerings. You know, like when you give me a grain offering, make sure there's salt in there. You know what I mean? Like like that somebody would eat it. Don't give me something that you wouldn't even eat. You hearing me? There better be salt in this covenant. It's a covenant of salt because I'm going to give you flavor, baby. But I'm expecting that back. You hear me? Okay. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, of course, because Abel is obviously present in this offering. And he's going, God, I want to give you something awesome and something good, something that I would want to get. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry because he was a Christian Buddhist, and his face fell and because the dress wouldn't swirl. 
The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? You know, <laughs> you're pouting, you know. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. As in, like, get your life together, bro. Like, it's not all about you. And that's a sin to, to, to de-center God and center yourself. That, in fact, that's the root of sin, is not recognize God, God as creator. Romans chapter 1. What was the root of all of the sin? They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And, and, and served the creature rather than the created. Right. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. First worship service, a dude dies. Right? <laughs> Failure at the altar, death in the field. Okay. Next passage. Leviticus 10. We got another pair of brothers, Nadab and Abihu. It's their first day of being, being priests. The blood of ordination is drying on their right ear and their right thumb and their right big toe. And first day on the job, and they grab their censers, and they offer to the Lord unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So they presume, assume, and speculate upon what God wants and how they can act around him and be around him as priests, right? And fire came up from before the Lord and consumed them and made them Chick-fil-A. Right? And they died before the Lord. Okay, next passage. You got David. David's a good guy. Great intentions. He wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant back into Israel. The Ark of the Covenant is God's resting place. Um, it's an important box. It's overladen with gold. And there's the two cherubim there. And wherever the Ark is, you know, God is there. And David wants the presence of God because he loves God. And he wants the Ark to be in their midst. And da 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 da. So David's bringing the house, the, the Ark back. Uh, into uh, that was is recaptured by the Philistines and David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord and they got the songs and they got the electric guitars and drums and when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon Uzzah who was a priest uh, put his out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen stumbled okay so Uzzah's a bad priest the reason he's a bad priest is because he knows how the ark of God is supposed to be carried with exactly the way that God has prescribed it. And the way that God's prescri prescribed it is with dignity and respect. This dude thought it would be a good idea to put it in the equivalent of a flat, old flatbed truck, like a Ford F-150. You have to just back that up, George. Yeah, we're going to put this arc on the back. You know, like, dude, I wouldn't even put a TV that I cared about in the back of a Ford F-150. You know what I'm saying? Much less a golden box with this God's presence. It was like, you know what I mean? Like, hello, right? And God's just like, you guys are completely disrespecting me. This is insanity. And so the ark, the oxen stumble, and Uzzah's like, uh-oh, you know, one of the cords is breaking, you know, like, tries to stop it, and God's just like, Ugh. sorry, dude. This is ridiculous. This is redonkulous. I'm God. Are you kidding me? All right, next passage. This is a little bit later. David summoned the priests, Zadok and Abiathar, and the Levites, uh, and said to them, You are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves, you and your brothers, so that you may bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place that I have prepared for it. Because you did not carry it the first time. The Lord our God broke out against us, because we did not seek him according to the rule. Um, and so what these guys end up doing is they end up carrying the, the, the ark, of God, the Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders with poles as Moses had commanded. Watch this, according to the word of the Lord. So, hey, like, I have, I'm, I'm a person. I have preferences. You know, if you had a dignitary here, you would at least have a green room for them and maybe, maybe carry them around. Like, I, I, I'm a king. I deserve a bit of respect. Show some self consciousness. Right? Show a bit of humility. Instead, you assume, you presume, and speculate, and you expect there to be blessing in life? No, the opposite's going to happen. Yikes. It gets worse. Next passage. <laughs> the next passage um, in Chronicles. Uh, this is Uzziah. Uzziah is a king in Jerusalem. <coughs> and um, 
This is the Uzziah that we read about in the opening chapters of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is this prophet, and it says, In the year that Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on his throne, exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple with glory, right? Isaiah sees God, and he hits the deck, and he's like, oh boy, you know, I, I, this is bad. I am unholy. And God's like, sweet. I love that you're showing some self-consciousness. And, you know, and, and you know, God's like, you want to help me? And he's like, no, I, want, I don't want to help you because I'm a man with a potty mouth. And God's like, cool. And he sends an angel that takes a coal from the altar and touches Isaiah's lips and cleanses his lips. Right? So Isaiah confess, admits that, hey, I'm unholy. And God's like, you're good. You're actually holy. I just need you to show some self-conscious, some humility. You hear me? Just recognize the difference between who I am and who you are. Yeah. That's sweet. You know, pound it. <laughs> Fist bump. Uzziah has a completely different reaction. And that's why Isaiah is going to mention this. Because these stories are juxtaposed to one another. Isaiah is different than Uzziah. Uzziah, when he was strong, he was a great military commander. And God gave him a ton of victories. He grew proud to his destruction. Because obviously, at the end of the day, pride is the root of Christian Buddhism. Right? It's the, it's, that's, the, that's Satan's issue. It was pride. Right? He's on a, Satan is on a spiritual journey. You hearing me? He's deconstructing. You know, twisting God's word adding to God's word, doubting God's word, causing other people to twist and distort God's word, misrepresenting God's word, projecting onto God what God is like when it's actually not the truth. God is not like that. God is exactly what his word says he's like. It's okay to have doubts. It's okay to get better. You know, you know what a great word for getting better theology is? Learning. You hearing me? We're all doing that. We all want to be better at understanding the word of God. And it's okay to have questions. Jesus wasn't intimidated by Thomas's doubts. Okay? But there's a difference between passive doubt and active unbelief. Huge difference. Uzziah, when he got strong, he grew proud of his destruction, for he was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. But Azariah the priest went in after him with 80 priests of the Lord who were men of valor, and they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah was angry. Now he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And when he became angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead in the presence of the priests in the house of the Lord by the altar of incense. And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked at him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead. And they rushed him out quickly, and he himself hurried to go out, because the Lord had struck him. And King Uzziah was a leper for the day, uh, to the day of his death, and being a leper lived in a separate house, for he was excluded from the house of the Lord. Death at the altar. Assume, presume, speculate from pride. I can do whatever I want. No, yeah, you kind of can't. You know, there's a way to worship the Lord, and God's looking for worshipers that will worship Him in spirit and in truth. And it's not safe for you to speculate that way. All right, we've been talking about the Old Testament, and some of you are folding your arms and you're going, Look, I don't like the Old Testament. Firstly, I have a philosophical issue with that because the Old Testament was Jesus' Bible and the, new, the, old, the early church's Bible and it's your Bible. But, but, but aside, aside from that, that misnomer, let's look at some deaths at an altar in the New Testament for fun. Let's, we'll just do that for fun. Okay, Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. I mean, there it is. You know, oh yeah, Old Testament God, he's, it's, like bad, it's like good cop, bad cop. So like Old Testament God, he's kind of like angry all the time. But like Jesus, he's sweet. He's a, my desperate boyfriend. Nope. No. No, didn't, Acts chapter 5. No, they're dropping like flies. 
these, these people come to church and they lie to the Holy Spirit. And Ananias drops dead. And then a couple hours later, his wife drops dead. Death at a worship service. Let's look at this next, this, this last um, fiasco. And this is at, at a church. This is actually at, this is the clearest New Testament look that we have at a church. It's like a, 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 a bird's eye view or pulling, pulling the drapes back at a, 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 a local church service. In 1 Corinthians 10, we're just going to set up 1 Corinthians 11 where we're, we're going to end. Uh, but 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 1 Corinthians 10 here, Paul calls the, the communion cup the cup of blessing. Okay, it's a cup of blessing. And the reason why it's a cup of blessing is, is because it is a participation in the blood of Christ. Like the blood of Christ is sick. It cleanses you from all unrighteousness, right? Like it's healing. There's life in the blood, right? It's powerful. The, the blood, the wonder-working power in the blood, right? And then uh, the bread is amazing because it is a participation in the body of Christ, all right? Just go back to that verse uh, really quickly. 1 Corinthians 10, there we go. It's a participation in the body of Christ, the bread that we break, okay? So when you are eating and drinking the Eucharist, the communion, you are eating and drinking spiritual and physical blessing into your life, right? Because our spiritual experience is not a, that's, I mean, we worship, it's physical, it's holistic, it's, it's fully integrated. You hearing me? It's a fully integrated Experience. If it wasn't, then we wouldn't do good works. You know what I'm saying? Like there wouldn't be any sort of ethic or morality. No, it's full integration. Right? There isn't like some sort of Greek Neoplatonic division in terms of, you know, our spirituality and our material. No, Christianity is a fully integrated psychosomatic reality. Okay, 1 Corinthians 11. Paul opens up this passage and he says, you're the worst church ever. He says, it, it's, he says verbatim, he says, it's worse when you gather. <laughs> Imagine that. I've never been to a church where it was worse. This church was worse. And we'll see in a moment why it's worse. It's worse because people are, the, t- the cup of blessing is turning into something else. Okay. Watch this. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. No, because it was the Lord's Supper, there would be life spiritually and physically. Okay? For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry and another gets drunk. Getting drunk at church, that's a new one. Okay? So, early church looked like this. People didn't have a huge gathering, and so they would gather at somebody's house, and they'd, they'd have a potluck. The potluck was called the love feast. And after the love feast, after the potluck, they would get to the bread and the wine and they'd say, hey guys, that was a great meal, but we're not here just for a casual meal. We're here to celebrate Jesus. And so they'd be, they would rehearse his, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and, think, and they, they're eating. And as they eat, Jesus is there. He shows up. The presence of the Holy Spirit shows up powerfully. And they begin to minister to one another prophetically. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Uh, you know, just the, the Holy Spirit ministering body ministry. Then they would sing, uh, have a worship time, and then there would be teaching at the end, okay? Now, the, the, the rich were the ones that would bring the food, obviously, because the poor didn't have any food to bring. But problematically, the culture is leaking into the church, and the rich who brought everything go first. They stuff themselves. <laughs> they drink all the wine, <laughs> right? The dude's like ham buckled up there, singing 99 bottles of beer on the wall, <laughs> Right? And, um, and so Paul goes, what? Right? Like, imagine pastoring a church like that. That's awesome. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, like, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? As in, you want to do that? You want to go Super Bowl Sunday? Do that at home. You know what I'm saying? There's a time and a place for Super Bowl Sunday. It's not here. You know? Uh, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? As in, they're making church all about themselves. Christian Buddhists make their spiritual journey all about themselves. 
It doesn't matter what God says. It's not about other people. It's all about them and what they think. I could never serve a God who sends people to hell. Oh, really? Wow. Oh, you're more merciful than God. And his word doesn't matter. Well, I'll, I can find a scripture that says that there. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can find a scripture to say pretty much anything you want. Satan does that. Right, Satan quoted scripture to Jesus three times out of context. Jesus quoted scripture back to Satan three times in context. It's God's word when it's in context. It's your words when you're manipulating it, twisting it for your own purposes. To satisfy your cultural inclinations, right? You've been formed. You know, I could never worship my God because, uh, you know, it's not popular. Because it just seems wrong. Well, what do we, you're 21. How do you know what's right? How are you now the judge of the God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? You're 21, dude. Show a little humility. Maybe when you're reading scripture and something bothers you, assume that God is right and you're wrong. There are things in scripture that tick me off. <laughs> but I gotta go, God, I'm, I'm not you. Let God be true and every man a liar, including myself. And I have to trust that you actually, you care about me. And what you say in here, it's good. And it's for my good. I gotta trust. I gotta trust your heart, and tr trust that what you've written here is for my good. You care about my human flourishing. You're not trying to frustrate me. You're trying to bless me. You know me better than I know myself. I don't know what's good for me. You know what's good for me. God, I'm I'm unholy. Oh, thank you for that self-consciousness. Here's the coal. What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, remember contextually here, what is it eating of the Lord in an unworthy manner? It's when you're making church all about yourself, your, your spiritual journey all about yourself, and you completely disregard who God is. You're not worshiping in spirit and in truth. Presuming, assuming, speculating. Will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. As in, now that cup of blessing is turned into a cup of judgment. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's scary. That's kind of the, whole, the whole point. Paul, as an apostle, is rebuking them. Watch this next verse. This is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, as in the way Isaiah did, Isaiah judged himself. Ooh, I'm unholy. <laughs> then we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So there's different judgment in the church. For example, Ananias and Sapphira, I don't believe that they went to hell condemned with the world. God was just, he's your, their parent and he judged them. So there's, there's condemnation in judgment and then there's discipline and there's retributive justice and then there's restorative justice. And so Ananias and Sapphira, even though they, were, they died, it was kind of like God going, yeah, that's not going to work. Time out. Do you know what I'm saying? It's a restorative judgment. This isn't, this isn't real life. The eternity is real life. In light of that, we need to understand the justice of God and the judgment of God. But God is a perfect judge. He judges perfectly. He's more merciful than anybody on the planet. And when he makes a judgment call, it's perfect. He is absolutely vindicated, and we can know that because he's absolutely holy.
and his holiness is about his absolute moral perfection. This next passage, Hebrews 12. So this is the posture that we need to have. I'm going to end with this passage. This is the posture that we need to have. The posture that we need when we come to church is, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. As in, God, thank you. Lord, thank you. I do not deserve to be here. I do not deserve to be here. I am unholy. Now, I have been sanctified by the blood of Jesus. I have been brought, you who are afar, have been brought close by his blood. Lord, I thank you for a righteousness that's not my own. Lord, I thank you that you've brought me, you know, and you've, you've counted me worthy. And Lord, I thank you that you're the one who began the good work in me and you're the one who's gonna finish that good work in me and you're gonna perfect that which concerns me and you know all of my problems and you still love me and you're working on me graciously and continually and Lord, I yield to that work. But I'm just so grateful. There's this moment in the mass. Um, Any ex-Catholics here? Any? There's like five of you? Come on, there's more ex-Catholics than that, okay. Y'all maybe remember in the mass, uh, I'm... Catholic family, you know, like my parents, I know, I know all, all about Catholicism. And there's this beautiful part of the Mass, I absolutely love it. The priest has the Eucharist, and the whole church repeats with him, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter my home. It's a gospel reading. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter my home. You're holding the bread. Only say the word, and your servant will be healed. That's the perfect posture. God, I'm not worthy that you should enter my home. As in, I'm not some cute, you love me because I'm cute. Like, God's love is sentimentality. It is not. God's love is holy. And he loves you, like I said in the beginning, you're worse than you think, but you're more loved than you can ever imagine. You know, and so his love is not sentimentality, but his love is going, it's, it's fixed, it's a fixed reality that in spite of your worst, you know, while we were still sinners, Christ died, died for the ungodly. So our response to that love is, Lord, I I am unholy. It's a a response to reality. It's it's truth. Lord, I'm just grateful. Thank you for saving me. And let's offer up to God acceptable worship. Worship that's acceptable to him. Worship that is truthful. Worship that he's asked for. Not something that you're mailing in. Something that you don't, giving him things that you don't care about. You know, it's always Isaacs that go up the mountain. You know, Isaac, the son of promise, the one that Abraham had been waiting for forever. He doesn't ask for Ishmael. You know, the side project. He asks for the main project. God always asks, for uh, bring Isaac up. Uh, that's what I care about. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm asking for it. Acceptable worship. <laughs> With reverence and awe. Why reverence and awe? Because God's a consuming fire. And this needs to temper our theology of God's love and grace. Is God love? Yes. I mean, you can find, you don't need the New Testament for that. Just read Psalm 103. He's slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and mercy. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed my transgression from me. He won't always chide. His anger is but a moment. His favor is a lifetime. That's who God is. But he's holy. And he's a king. And I need to reverence him. And reverence doesn't mean take your hat off in church. It means, God, I, I tremble at your word. And I respect, I respect you and I honor you. I'm not scared of fire. I've never been scared of fire because I respect fire. My dad told me about fire. You know, he's like, if you touch it, it'll burn you. Yeah, if you touch, don't, so don't mess with it. Don't play with it. Respect it. And, when, and so I never, I'm not scared of it. Because I respect it. In the same way, you don't need to be scared of God. Some of you, are, maybe if you're getting the wrong impression of this message, this message isn't about being scared of God because sometimes he kills people. That's not, that's not, this, that's not the takeaway today. The takeaway is that we serve a holy God who's a consuming fire 
and he's safe. So there's benefits of the fire. There's benefits of his warmth and his light and his power. You hearing me? Um, but you need to respect and reverence and awe. And that is worshiping him in spirit and in truth. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for your word. Father, we love your word. We tremble at your word. We're not scared of you because you don't want us to be scared of you. You're our father. Uh, but as a good father, like even like our earthly fathers, we recognize that tension of, you know, you love us and we're a little, we're a little scared. <laughs> in that sense. God, I ask you that our church and our churches and our generation would recover this truth, that we would recover reverence and awe. Lord, that we would be people who put your word first. God, I ask you that you'd forgive us if there's been places in our life where we've been making Christianity, serving you, all about us, all on our terms, all about you know, what we can get out of it. Lord, forgive us for being people who are just trying to hit you up for Krispy Kreme, you know, or projecting onto you, you know, that you're this way or that way, and even in some ways misrepresenting what you're really like to the world. Forgive us, Lord. Thank you that you're patient with us. And, and we follow you so imperfectly. We follow you so imperfectly. And you're okay with that but you're looking for, you're just looking for humility. You're just looking for, for, for people who know, yeah, I, I'm not you, I'm unholy, and I want, and I need you, God. Lord, we need the cup of blessing. We need your grace into our life. We need, you know, I, I just feel moved right now to pray for anybody who's sick, anybody who's sick right now, because you're in the presence of Jesus. And, you know, Jesus was, wounded for our transgressions and uh, by his stripes we're healed. If you're sick today, why don't you just lift your hand to the Lord and go, yeah, I'm sick and you know, I just need to re receive a touch uh, from, from Jesus. Father, I thank you right now. Just, it's not, you're not lifting your hand to me, you're lifting it to the Lord just, just to receive. Just kind of make like a hand to receive. God, we receive your healing right now. Father, we thank you for your presence. We're, here, we're thankful, Jesus, that you're here to heal right now. We thank you, Lord, we see, we receive it. If you need some forgiveness, I'm not gonna ask you to put your hand up, but if you need the mercy of God in your life right now, receive it right now. Just go, God, I'm a sinner and I need your mercy. I need your grace. If you need grace in your life, the power of God that's able to transform you, it's God's energy towards you so that you can live a triumphant life. Just receive it right now in Jesus' name. God, I need your grace. I receive your grace right now. Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm not worthy that you should enter my home. Only say the word, that word that you spoke the worlds into existence, that powerful, authoritative word. Speak that word right now, God, into our situations, Lord, into our sickness. Father, into our brokenness, into our rebellion, speak your word, God. Lord, we receive your word right now in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you that there's provision in the blood of Jesus. We thank you that there's provision at the cross right now for the things that we have need of, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your presence. Lord, if we've been, we've been on a path that has been a path where it's not questions, but it's beginning to become divergent and it's beginning to become self-centered and, and it's not guided by your word, it's guided by our own earthly desires. We're, try, we're basically trying to create a religion in, in which all of the parts of us fit. We, we, we ask for your forgiveness and we ask for your grace. Lord, let, let your grace come to us to be continually repentant, to co be continually just coming back to your word and going, Lord, this is your word. This is your word. This is who you are.
there somebody here with like a, a right knee problem? A right knee problem. Thank you, Lord. Father, I just thank you for your healing. I thank you for your healing, Lord. I ask you that you would heal in Jesus' name, that, that knee. Is there somebody here with a gallbladder problem? Gallbladder inflammation. Father, thank you for your healing in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. There's somebody here. I'm going to be done. I'm going to hand the service over to Alex. There's somebody here, and this message has really spoken to you. And if we had a conversation afterwards, I'm going to run to the airport and I'm going to fly home to my wife. <laughs> um, she, and I'm going to surprise her. She doesn't know that I'm coming home. Um, I was supposed to go home tomorrow, but um, I'm going to run home. But if we had a conversation after, if we had a conversation after this service and um, you would come up to me and you'd go, Nate, I have been going down a path in my faith uh, where you know, I don't even know if I believe anymore. And it's not like, you know, you're Thomas and you have proximity to Jesus. It's, at a, it's becoming, it's an unraveling. It's an unraveling of your faith where you don't know if you believe in the scriptures anymore. You don't know if you believe in God anymore. Um, in this message, you sense the Holy Spirit really convicting you and calling you back to confessional Christianity, which is where you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth some stuff that you can't even necessarily prove, but you just, it's, that's what it is, is you're, you're putting your trust in somebody and you're putting your trust in Jesus and his words. It's not just Jesus as some metaphysical idea and then divorced from his words that are recorded in scripture by his friends and eyewitnesses. You, you, the Holy Spirit's calling you back to confessional Christianity where you love Jesus and his words. If that's you, and I'm not asking you to put your hand up, but if that's you, I'm asking you to connect with either Adam or, or Pastor Alex or Pastor Diana or Philip because I, I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to really reveal himself to you like God wants to reveal himself to you in a powerful way you need a, a truth encounter which I believe you've had today but you need a power encounter just a fresh encounter with the Holy Spirit thank you Jesus Church, why don't we stand up? Why don't we stand up and worship together? Come on, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. You're a holy God. You're an awesome God. And in that holy love, you've decided to come close to us. For that, we're forever grateful. For that, we are forever surrendering to you. We repent today, God. We repent if we've made this all about us. We repent if we've made the word all about us. If we've served you or given you worship however we want. We want to give you the best because you deserve the best. We give you the best because you've given us every breath that we take, every day that we live is a gift from you. And so we're sorry. We repent. Forgive us today. And help us to be grateful for this presence, for the fire that leads us, for the fire that warms us, for the fire that purifies us. We give you all of the honor, all of the glory today. It all belongs to you. 
with eyes closed and head bowed. If you're here today and you don't know God and you feel far from God, you just heard one of the best messages ever on God's holiness and how we're all sinners and we need him. If you're in here today and you're saying, I need a relationship with God. I know I've sinned, I've done wrong, thought wrong. The Bible says all of us have. There's not one perfect person in this place. But God in his infinite love sent Jesus. Jesus grabbed my sin, your sin. The Bible says he took it upon his shoulders, went up on a cross, and Jesus died for the sins of the world. He went down to a grave, he was dead for three days, but after three days, Jesus Christ, he resurrected. He died for our sin, and he resurrected so that we would have new life. Today, if you're saying, Alex, I need forgiveness, and I need a brand new beginning, I need a brand new, new start, I'm tired of the way I'm living, I'm tired. I'm tired of choosing my own way, I'm tired of continuing to run into trouble, and maybe you got some shame in your life, you've done some stuff that nobody knows about. Can I tell you, there's healing, there's forgiveness, and there's freedom today. With eyes closed and head bowed, if you're in here, I'm gonna count to three of you. If you're saying, I need Jesus, I need forgiveness, I want a relationship with God, at the count of three, can you raise your hand? Nobody looking around in a moment of prayer, in a moment of privacy. At the count of three, you raise it up. I just wanna see who I'm praying for, then you can put it right back down. One, two, three, raise your hand. Wherever you're at, raise your hand. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Amazing, God bless you, awesome. You can put your hands back down. I'm gonna say a simple prayer. And this prayer doesn't save anybody as far as because I said it, but it's putting our faith and our trust in Jesus. In fact, all of us together as one big family, we're gonna repeat it out loud. We're saying this prayer with you. Come on, repeat after me. Say, Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity. I admit that I'm a sinner and that my sin separates me from you. Jesus, Come into my life, be my Lord, and be my Savior. From today on, I'm healed, I'm forgiven, and I'm saved. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Hey, some hands went up in the auditorium, and if you're watching online and you made that decision as well, outside we got tents for connect groups. We also have a tent for new Christians, and if you raise your hand, we want to gift you a new Bible. Make sure you pass by there and see them. This Bible is absolutely free for you, so make sure you pick it up. Thank you, JP. Anybody thankful for Nathan's life? Beautiful. What a beautiful message on God's holiness. Kind of wild. You can look at some dark scripture and then appreciate God so much more. His mercy and His grace. What a gift. He's anointed. Can, can you pray for Him? Can we commit to pray for him, pray for him and his wife? What he's taking on is huge. Subscribe to Theo's University. It's the best Bible college online. It's just phenomenal. And it's super cheap. He's made it available. I love that he wants to teach scripture to this young generation. I love his reverence of scripture. I love his awe of scripture. And I love how he doesn't cut corners with it. And I think we need that back. Because God is a consuming fire. And so we thank God for Nathan's life. Next week, we start the book of Acts. It's going to be awesome, and uh, I can't wait. Bring somebody with you. It's going to be awesome. I think, can we sing that song again? All to Jesus, I surrender. Love you, church. Pray you have an incredible Sunday. Let's leave out of here worshiping. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we give you all the glory, all the honor. Thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Hallelujah. To you be all the glory. To you we surrender our lives. For you we will live. For you, God, will serve you all the days of our life. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, all to Jesus, I surrender.